Welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists webinar series. We're so glad you could join us today. My name is Amber Robinson, and I am an environmental scientist and project manager for HDR Engineering out of Lafayette, Louisiana. As co-chair of the webinar planning committee, I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's webinar. We are excited to share an SWS e-learning experience um, during a time like now. This webinar is a great way to stay connected to the wetland community during the pandemic, and we hope that everyone is well. Today's lecture and topic will be urban wetland management in Cameroon, challenges and prospects. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Kongzo Edith. Kongzo W. Edith is a PhD fellow at the University of Baminda, Cameroon, and has been a researcher at the Ministry of Scientific Research and Innovation National Institute of Cartography in Cameroon since January of 2016. She applies GIS and remote sensing in natural resource management and environmental protection with a focus on wetlands. And now, here's Kongzo. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity for giving me the opportunity to share with you our experience on wetlands in Cameroon. Growing up in Cameroon, the rural area, wetlands were generally known to us as Lamba or Elobi or Sha, but with little exposure into the world, we later realized that it was called wetlands, which was considered as no man's land, as it was. It was owned by the state and nobody had the right to it. Given the fact that uh, the riparian the, the population lived on these wetlands owned by the state, there was a need for the management of these wetlands. This, given its importance, this therefore pushed the government to join the Ramsar Convention and recognize most of the wetland sites as priority sites. Thus, having more uh, measures for the ma wetland management as in relation to the Ramsar Convention. So with this, therefore, bring us to the topic of wetland management in Cameroon, the challenges and prospects, given the challenges that were faced during the management of the wetlands. Our presentation outline will be as follows. We have the introduction, Cameroon and the Ramsar Convention, a case study of the Yaoundé Seven, the wetlands, urban wetlands of the Yaoundé Seven, and draft conclusion and recommendation. Cameroon is located between the, the western, western and the central part of Africa. It's in between and is generally known as Cameroon in miniature, given its cultural and geographical diversity. It has a political, as political capital, Yaoundé, and has a population of over 25 million inhabitants. It's located within the semi-arid tropical and equatorial zones. So it's, it cuts across three climatic zones. Cam wetlands in Cameroon were generally known as wet wastelands. But as time went on, it became the one of the most solicited natural resources in the country after the forest and the subsoil resources. This therefore intensified the number of activities of anthropogenic activities involved in the wetlands. In Cameroon generally, we have wetlands such as floodplains, riverine wetlands, lakes, coastal wetlands, and mangrove wetlands. Cameroon, Cameroon joined the Ramsar Convention as it's in a bit to be able to manage this wetlands given the, its importance to the, to, the, to the riparian population and the environmentalists. So come on, join the Ramsar, the Ramsar Convention as the 151st party to the convention on July, 2006. It was concretized by ministerial degree number 63 of March 2007, where that officially announces the creation of the Ramsar Committee for Wetland Management in Cameroon within the Ministry of Environment and Nature Protection. This was done in accordance with recommendation number 5.7 of the fifth meeting of contracting parties held in Kyosho, 
Japan in 2007. With the signing of this interministerial committee, Cameroon therefore, therefore came up with a Ramsar sites, which were diverse and Cameroon counted ab about seven Ramsar sites within their territory. These sites include the Wazalogon floodplain, the Barumbi Mbo Crater Lake, a section of the Sanaga River, the Rio de Re Estuary, Cameroon section of the Lake Chad Basin, and the Tem, the Tem River and the Ebogo wetlands. This, some of these wetlands, like the Lake Chad Basin, is located in the Sahelian zone of, the, of Cameroon, and it's in, it shares boundaries with Chad, Nigeria, and Niger, making it very strategic as far as geostrategy and geopolitics is concerned. So there was a need for the effective management of those wetlands in order to avoid conflict. We also they have the Ebogo wetlands, which is located in the central region of Cameroon. Its peculiarity being an ecotouristic site, which was chosen by the World Health Organization as, an, as a suitable site for ecotourism. So making this wetland a strategic wetland as far as wetland management in Cameroon is concerned. We also have the Wazalogon floodplain, which is, which is about 6, 600,000 hectares. The peculiarity with this is that it serves as a source of livelihood to the northern part of Cameroon, as it has its home to more than 200,000 people. Uh, people living around the area and they practice activities such as fishing and agriculture around these wetlands, exerting a lot of pressure on the wetland. With those Ramsar sites, those are priority sites, they are prospective Ramsar sites that are being that are in the in the process of being recognized as Ramsar sites. There we have the Ma, the Ma Bed Bed National Park, the lower part of the Sanaga. The, the floodplains of the Nyong, the Lake Osa, the Kamhuri, the Batoke, Batoke Bakingili wetlands of the Southwest regions, which, the, which are in the process of being finalized as Ramsar site in Cameroon. Despite this important, in addition to this important Ramsar site, there are other minor wetlands, a lot of inland wetlands that do not recognize as Ramsar sites play a very important role in, in, in the subsistence of its riverine uh, riparian population and, and uh, climate change mitigation within the, 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 the urban areas. With all this, the presence of all these wetlands within Cameroon, there was a need to put in place organs to, to effectively manage wetlands in Cameroon. This therefore prompted the Ministry of Environment, Environment, Natural Protection and Sustainable Development to create an inter-ministerial committee which had as objective to identify, describe and evaluate the effects of human activities on the wetlands. This was found to be very effective as it involves uh, the uh, several ministries within the country. We have, for example, the Ministry of Tourism and Recreation, as I earlier talked about the Ebogo Wetlands, which is an eco-touristic site. The Ministry of Territorial Administration, which came in place with the wetlands of the, of the Lake Chad Basin, which is an inter-territorial administration. So it's a geostrategic wetland. We have the Ministry of Scientific Research, which is involved in research concerning wetlands and wetland produce. We have, for example, the, the JICA project on, on wetland rice production, which is going on along uh, around the wetlands of Yaoundé seven subdivisions. With the implementation of the Ramsar Convention, Cameroon recorded some degree of success in the application of Ramsar, the Ramsar Convention. This was seen in the domain of communication, communication network where education and public awareness programs were, were created on wetlands to educate the people on the importance of wetlands. This was also done through video documentaries and videograms 
that were passed over the national TV to educate people on the importance of wetlands and their impact on the over on the on the on the activities they carry out on these wetlands. There was also the distribution of brochures providing information on the various Ramsar sites in Cameroon and to and the protection of species. They held roundtable discussions with various stakeholders involved in wetland management included. Also, the second point was to, to support, there was a, a degree of success in the mapping of invasive aquatic plants in the Lake Osa wetlands. Also, data collected from certain wetlands was also done in order to record them as Ramsar sites. We have the examples of the site earlier stated. Development of political and legal, political, legal and technical tools for the implementation of the Ramsar project in Cameroon, Ramsar Convention in Cameroon. This, this led to the creation of laws, enactment of laws, and, and uh, 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 put concretizing the, the, the decisions of the Ramsar Convention in Cameroon. Also, there, there is the holding of meetings for the consolidation of, of the, Ramsar, uh, uh, the Ramsar Plan of Action in Cameroon, which is one of the, the most important objectives of the Ramsar Convention to ensure that wetlands within the countries are well managed. Despite all these successes recorded, uh, in the implementation of the Ramsar Convention, there are lots of challenges that wetland management in Cameroon faces. The first of its challenges is the demographic pressure exerted on the wetlands and the irrational exploitation of wetlands. We see this in the domain of agriculture, settlement, and waste disposal. It cannot be avoided because it is so obvious in a way that it has led to the degradation, the loss and degradation of wetlands, especially in urban areas. Also, we have the absence of decision-making plans or plan of actions and their implementations. Generally, decisions are taken at the, at the, at the up of the ladder and implemented on the local populations this make it, makes it very difficult to be implemented as generally the population living on wetlands are generally poor and less educated people. So it's seen as a challenge for it to be implemented based on, based on the fact that their, their opinion was not taken into consideration. There's also the low awareness of the social, of the values of the wetlands be it social, economic, or ecological. So generally, the stakeholders see it as what they want. Those seeing it as wet, as wet, as wet uh, wasteland, and those seeing it as agricultural land or real estate property. This makes it very challenging for policies to be implemented. There's also the proliferation of invasive aquatic plants. This is general, these are generally plants from, from agriculture that are introduced into the wetlands that end, ends up invading the whole wetland and corrupting uh, uh, and, and capturing the other plants that are there. We also have a low synergy between stakeholders. This is very important as stakeholders don't, they don't meet to discuss on the prospects of the wetlands. Generally, each stakeholder manages in a way that suits his or her interests. Here we have, for example, those using it for agriculture, their, their goal is to cultivate and have the most produce out of it as possible, while ignoring the, 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 the environmentalist whose role is to protect the, the wetlands to maintain it at its natural state. Given the pressure and the, the, the destabilization of the natural system of the wetlands, there's this, the, the normal recycling process of the wetland is not carried out, leading to the spread of diseases. As it, stays, it serves as a, as a breeding ground for mosquitoes, 
mostly the female Anopheles mosquitoes, which is a vector for the spread of the malaria parasite. Also, we have the spread of a typhoid fever generally caused by the Salmonella typhi virus, which lives, generally lives in water. That notwithstanding, there are future priorities in the application of wetlands in Cameroon. For example, we have the adoption and the implementation of the Ramsar National Plan. So there are, there are, there are priorities, it serves as a priority for the, for the government and the stakeholders to try as much as possible to implement this plan in the Gramsa Cameroon National Plan of Action. We also have the mapping of national wetlands, the invention of new wetland sites to, to increase the list of Ramsar sites in Cameroon for better management, the establishment of a framework, a legal, and, a legal institutional and technical framework to ensure the sustainable management of wetlands in Cameroon. Also, we have the finalization of the process of listing of wetland sites in Cameroon. This therefore leads us to a case study, which is the urban, urban wetland management in the Yaoundé 7 subdivision. Here, it's, it's a peculiar case of urban wetland management in Cameroon, which applies to most of the wetlands in Cameroon and in most developing countries. Here, Yaoundé 7 is, is located uh, at, at the equatorial region of Cameroon. And it's, this wetlands generally falls within the altitude of 700 to 750 meters above sea levels and has a, an annual precipitation of 1,600 millimeters per year with a population of 22,000 inhabitants on the wetlands as which must have doubled since the last population census. During the study, we tried to get a, a, a perception how the, the population perceive wetlands. 50% of them considered west, wetlands as land, while the least about 12% considered west, wetlands as wastelands, and they found no value attached to this wetland. While we try to inquire the mode of acquisition of the wetlands, 31% said they purchased the wetlands, which was questionable as generally this land belongs to the state, not to individuals. There we saw the, 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 there's a conflict of interest around there as nobody was supposed to sell the land. Some of them, about 31% said they inherited the wetlands from their parents which was normal because generally in a village setting or in a local setting, land is generally owned by families, which can be inherited. That 7% said they were renting it temporarily for their activities. These wetlands within the Yaoundé 7 was classified to identify wetland classes. And the following classes were identified. We had degraded wetlands, dense vegetation. We had woody wetlands, farmlands, herbaceous wetlands and riparian vegetation with open water bodies. The image, the image on the, by the side shows the different images of the wetlands. Forested wetlands were generally wetlands on which trees have been planted to absorb water to, for, for according to, to the stakeholder planting the trees was to valorize the land by absorbing water and making it firm soil. We could identify degraded wetlands, which was mostly used for waste disposal, and we found a lot of plastics and pet bottles within the wetlands. Farmlands were mostly used for market gardening. One of the, while looking at the different activities on the wetlands, one of the first major activities was that of settlement. It was noticed that 32% of the, of the total surface area of Yaoundé 7 was covered by, was, was covered by settlement. And about 5,422 houses fell within the wetlands. This led to great uh, uh, consequences, which could be seen as flooding. During the rainy season, most of this, the houses within these wetlands were covered by water, leading to the displacement of inhabitants and, and, and a lot of casualties. 
even though with this with this with this effect on the population it was it is still very difficult to be able to displace the population from the area the second major activities happening on the wet land was agriculture which was mostly market gardening we had market gardening for, for local consumption, for household consumption as for, and for commerce, because it serves as a source of income to most of the local populations. Some of these wetlands serve as, as a, a nurseries for flower gardening and, and, and plantation farming, as most of the seedlings when are nursed on the wetlands before being taken to the plantation. Those who consider the waste wetlands are wasteland, it, it was so obvious because most of the wetlands, a, a section of the wetlands were considered really as dump sites. We could see some effects of some like pet bottles, disposal waste, we could identify some cases of eutrophication and a lot of algae going up on, on, the, on, the, on the wetlands, which makes it very difficult. While looking at the dynamics, or the changes in the wetlands within the Yaoundé seven subdivisions, it was realized that built up area increased drastically between 2007 and 2017. That's a 10 years intervals. It increased from 16% to about 35%. And the vegetation cover rather dropped from 48% to 18%. This shows a significant a, a, a significant uh, a drop, a significant loss and degradation on those wetlands, which was very detrimental to the health of the wetlands. With all the, 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 the impact of human activities on these wetlands, there was a need to come in, to come forth with prospects, measures to better manage these wetlands. The first proposal, we, the first uh, uh, option we had was to cre the creation of buffer zone. This was like to create a buffer zone of about 100 meters from the wetlands. This serves as a restriction zone or a sponge zone where people were res restricted to carry on anthropogenic activities so as to ensure the health of the wetlands. Also, we, we, we encourage a participatory approach, approach for, to ensure the sustainable management of these wetlands. This was, this, the idea behind this was to, to bring on the table all the stakeholders involved in wetland management. We give the objectives of the wetlands, which is to identify the wetland assets, monitor and ensure the wise use of these wetlands. Methods and tools were proposed, which were the most significant was the use of remote sensing and GIS, uh, the administering of questionnaires for qualitative and quantitative analysis. In order to, to be able to use all this, these tools and methods proposed, there was a need for a capacity building and seminars where incentives had, has to be given in order to encourage the stakeholders to abandon their different activities and get involved in wetland management. Also, there was, there was a need to, in, to include field data collection where data is collected, be it qualitative, quantitative, cartographic, remotely sensed, are, are collected and through work groups, uh, uh, workshops and capacity and, and create and recreation programs are synchronized and the data, the data, while the database is being updated, we look for recommendation based on existing data that I, data that, is, that we collected from the field and propose plans to ensure the monitoring of these wetlands to be able to attain the objectives earlier stated. We also propose the use of remote sensing in wetland management through geospatial tools, where we propose a high resolution after a comparative study between Landsat images, spot images, and Google Earth images. We, we encourage the use of Google Earth images, which could be zoomed at a higher resolution, and with a little bit of expertise 
can be manipulated to ensure the monitoring, the effective monitoring of wetlands, of especially urban wetlands that have lost its natural boundaries from settlement. We also proposed, we also proposed the use of GIS in the creation of buffer zones in the administering of queries. This was this was a more scientific way of, of, of creating buffer zones and of delimiting houses that falls within the wetlands. This is because just going to the field and say you leave the wetland because you are within the wetland, they will see it as a sort of bad fit and bias. But if maps are produced and buffer zones limited, and the, the, the stakeholders see clearly that they fall within the wetland zones, it is more logical for them to leave the wetland than to go with, with, with your bare hands and you try to explain them that where you're staying is a, it's a wetland and it's, uh, it needs to be conserved. And if you tamper with it, it will be at risk for you. So GIS was more ideal for the identification for the for delimiting these buffer zones for, to ensure a sustainable management of those wetlands. Also, another major problem in wetland management was data storage and redundancy. So we proposed the use of GIS, where with a simple query, you could, we could identify the, the number of settlements or the number of houses that have encroached into the wetlands between 2000 and Seven and 2017. This makes it very easy and, and it, it avoids repetition of work and redundancy of data. So GIS serves as a good storage data management system for the storage of data obtained from wetlands, be it economical, social, cultural. GIS was found to be perfect for it. In conclusion, Cameroon has identified seven Ramsar sites, even though with other Ramsar sites on that project for, 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 uh, for recognition as Ramsar sites. This Ramsar site covers a total of 827,060 hectares, which faces similar challenges as surviving wetlands within the Yaoundé 7 subdivision. This is a very important this is very important, especially to the riverine population, as it stands, as it stands as a layout for them before establishing into the wetlands. With the, with the increase of this population into the wetlands at the detriment of the environment and the wetlands, there is a massive loss and degradation of wetlands within of wetlands in Cameroon, which is far, which is, which has been estimated to be three times more than forest resources, which is, which was thought to be one of the most important resources with regards to wetlands. So in conclusion, there's therefore a need to put in place policies, tools, and the effective manpower with technical know-how for the effective management of wetlands in Cameroon. As recommendations, we had as recommendation, the main recommendation was to, to ask the central, for the central government to ensure a participatory approach in urban wetland management within, within the national territory as it involves all stakeholders to put in place applicable laws and strong institutional framework to ensure the sustainable management of urban wetlands and other wetlands in Cameroon. To, to use the, to, to apply remote sensing and GIS as it is cost and time effective in the management and monitoring of wetlands within the national territory. To ensure the creation of buffer zones as it's within our own wetlands as it serves as sponge for the mitigation of the impacts of wetlands in the, within, within the national territory. The government should also finance projects, research projects on wetlands, so as to valorize and ensure the sustainability of uh, wet, the genetic banks of wetlands. 
This is because generally there are other priorities within Cameroon. Being in less developed countries, there's a lack of roads and other infrastructures. So there's no, the government sees no weight in financing wetland projects, whereas there are roads leading to villages that are, are not even accessible. So with all that said, I think wetlands in Cameroon, it has a future. Wetland management in Cameroon has a future with the research going on and with the implementation of other activities within the wetlands. The, the management of wetlands in Cameroon, it will, will go of a long way to meet up with the objectives of the Ransat Convention. Thanks so very much for your keen attention. We are proud to recognize our SWS webinar series sponsors for 2022, Whittington Group, Wild Note, Delta Land Services, and in situ. You can find their information at the websites listed above. Please visit, like, and follow our SWS webinar sponsors. Our next English language webinar will be September 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern and will be joined by John Etkin and Julia Beck for a presentation on hands-on wetlands education with WOW, the wonders of wetlands educator's guide. Our next Spanish language webinar will be September 21st with Dr. Fabian Alejandro Rodriguez Zaragoza, who will discuss biodiversity and ecosystem functioning of coral reefs. Check out our website and social media channels to learn more and register for upcoming events. And please don't forget to complete the survey that will be sent to you after this webinar to receive a certificate of participation and to provide feedback on the webinar series. And of course, if you feel like you have an important topic to share, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to consider you for a webinar next year. Thanks again to Kongzo, our presenter, and to our audience for participating. Have a wonderful day. Stay well.